In the world of retro gaming, one thing is safe to say. There isn't any shortage of subpar emulation machines that line the end caps of your local big box retailer. Filled to the brim with dozens of games, these sorts of devices are usually good for a quick thrill and little else. But could a device that seems like it would fit easily into such a niche be something more? Blaze Entertainment has set out to give us something a bit higher quality with the Evercade, a portable retro gaming console with interchangeable cartridges. The Evercade from Blaze Entertainment was announced in late spring of 2019 and was met with a bit of speculation and excitement. The idea of a retro game focused handheld wasn't anywhere near a new idea, but Blaze had something else up their sleeve, interchangeable cartridges that featured officially licensed games instead of the usual hodgepodge of poorly emulated pirated properties and weird hacks meant that there was a certain bar that was at least attempting to be met. Upon release during spring of 2020, the Evercade retails for between 80 to 100 US dollars. The lower priced one includes a single pack in cartridge, while the more expensive one, the premium pack, includes three game cartridges. Each one of these contains a parcel of games, a mix of beloved classics and relative deep cuts from Namco, Interplay, Technos, Data East, and more on systems like the Atari 2600, NES, Genesis, and Super Nintendo. These retail for about $20 each, so it really comes down to no more than a couple bucks per game. The physical carts come in clamshell cases which give the impression of Genesis or Mega Drive packaging, which helps to set the Evercase ecosystem apart from the other devices poised to fill a similar niche. Blaze Entertainment sent us a premium package along with a stack of games to check out for this video. It's currently available at a number of retailers in the UK, but here in the US it seems to be primarily Amazon exclusive. The Evercade is a surprisingly well-built and robust device. The white with red accent color scheme is unique and works well in differentiating it from the pack. Its form factor is slightly wider and thicker than a PlayStation Portable 2000 or 3000, but is significantly lighter in comparison, which makes sense given the age of the hardware and the horsepower the Evercade needs under the hood anyway. The four face buttons, marked A, B, X, and Y, are nice and taut although the font used for their designations doesn't really fit with the otherwise cohesive style of the system. A set of L and R shoulder buttons use micro switches and are perfectly clicky. However, their placement, size, and travel distance mean that they're extremely easy to bump in the heat of the moment. Thankfully, outside of Super NES titles, I haven't run into anything that uses these buttons anyway. Early versions of the Evercade had mismatched button mapping, which made very little sense from system to system. Thankfully, this has been rectified via a firmware update which is fairly easy to perform if you have access to a computer. Hopefully, future firmwares will incorporate options for custom mapping so that everyone can play how they want. The disc-style D-pad is large and surprisingly good. Despite the lack of any sort of pronounced central pivot, it's efficient enough for the games on the system thus far. And lastly, you have Start, Select, and a Menu button for basic functionality, which also seems like they could be easily pressed but I didn't have a problem with that myself. Other buttons and ports of note are the volume buttons, headphones, and a USB port on the bottom, and a power switch and mini HDMI output on the top. Cartridges are inserted on the underside and are flush with the system giving it a smooth, cohesive look. An internal rechargeable battery lasts for around four to five hours on a single charge and can be refilled via the USB port. But strangely, the battery indicator is only visible via each cartridge's game selection menu. Once you power on the system with a cartridge inserted, it loads up a game selection menu immediately after a short boot sequence. Surprisingly, if you turn it on without a game inserted, you just get a blank screen telling you to insert a game. The main reason for this is that each game's interface, along with the emulator used for each game, is stored on the cartridge itself. Pressing the menu button from the main interface brings up a number of options for screen ratio, screen brightness, an audio toggle, language, and credits. If pressed in game, you can access save states so you can save and load your game at any time. 
The 4.3 inch 16 by 9 screen has a resolution of 480 by 272, which matches the PlayStation Portable. A 16 by 9 screen is a bit of an odd choice since it's a retro focused game system, and thus a 4 3 aspect ratio would be more appropriate. However, it's entirely possible that games with a wider ratio need might show up later on in the system's lifetime. Although the screen is backlit, at times it can be challenging to get just the right viewing angle depending on the game. Darker games often look too dark unless you position your system just right. Connecting to your HDTV via the mini HDMI port gives you 720p output to your display. It's pretty much plug and play, as long as you make sure to insert the HDMI cable before you power on the system. Now, the system will reboot on its own if the cable is inserted or removed during gameplay, but it would still lead to weird issues here and there. Just be sure to use a save state if you want to move from the TV to handheld mode or vice versa. Don't expect this to be as seamless as a Switch or anything. As I understand it, the Evercade currently uses a non-standard HDMI video output protocol, which might lead to audio issues with certain capture cards or HDTVs. Joe from GameSack experienced this with his Elgato capture device, while I only ran into a handful of them with my StarTech PEX HD Cap 60L card, so your mileage may vary. Much more annoying to me was the incessant buzzing that comes from the handheld itself while in HDMI mode, which varies in loudness depending on the game. The game selection interface is designed to use the full 16x9 screen real estate. Classic games are scaled to fill the vertical resolution of the screen while retaining their natural 4x3 aspect ratio. If you simply cannot stand to have any black bars on your screen, then each game can also be stretched to full screen. No matter what you choose though, you wind up with uneven scaling on both the horizontal and vertical axes, which causes the usual shimmer when the screen scrolls in any direction. To help mask this, most emulators used across the Evercade's library employ a bilinear blurring filter, although how this is used can vary between playing in handheld mode and via TV output, so the visual quality tends to fluctuate from emulator to emulator. Speaking of HDTV output, the 720p resolution is usually a natural fit for 240p scaling, but in this case, it seems as though each game's visible play area has been scaled to 720, which gives uneven results for all currently supported platforms. This looks especially poor in vertically scrolling shooters. Horizontally, if you're using the original 4-3 aspect ratio, games are scaled to 960 pixels wide universally. For games whose original resolutions are 320 pixels wide, such as some Sega Genesis and Atari 7800 games, this is a perfect 3x integer scale and shouldn't give any shimmer while scrolling horizontally in those games. Obviously, games that are 256 pixels wide, such as NES, Super Nintendo, and other Sega Genesis games will be unevenly scaled to 960 horizontally, so they'll have shimmering on both axes. In some cases, you could set your screen mode to full since 1280 is an integer scale of 256. You could then use your TV or capture device's 4-3 aspect ratio setting to squish the image back to the correct size without shimmer. Unfortunately, this isn't always foolproof due to the visible play area being scaled, so it doesn't always work as it should. Still, whether you're playing in handheld mode or tethered to an HD TV, it looks okay, and I think that the intended audience will feel that it's perfectly fine. Which I suppose leads us to a discussion about expectations. What is expected of a device like this? And who is the intended audience? The Evercade tries to straddle a fine line of being something that might entice more hardcore retro enthusiasts while still being approachable for others. By presenting itself as a platform with physical game releases rather than just another portable emulation novelty, the hardcore audience will likely perk up an ear, but the most discerning will probably have little interest in actually playing on a device like this. On the other hand, a younger audience might be interested in the Evercade as a gaming machine, but the library might not interest them all that much, especially in a world where more powerful portable alternatives exist. So let's take a closer look at some of the games that are spread out across all the various cartridges available for the Evercade and see how they play, or more importantly, how they're emulated. To 
despite the Cade part of the Evercade name, at this time, none of the games available for the system are actually arcade games. Instead, the library is primarily composed of Atari 2600, Atari 7800, original Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and Super Nintendo games. Future compilations will focus on other systems, such as the Atari Lynx. The three premium edition pack-in carts, Atari Collection 1, Interplay Collection 1, and Data East Collection 1 have 36 games between them. I'll be the first to admit that Atari games aren't exactly my strength. Although Pitfall is the first game I remember playing in my lifetime, I'm not super familiar with the ins and outs of how the Atari 2600 and Atari 7800 work. Among the 20 games included in Atari Collection 1 are some of the most iconic games on the system. Adventure, Missile Command, Asteroids, and Crystal Castles being the ones that my family had growing up. You'd assume that these would be the absolute easiest games to emulate, and indeed, they do seem to run fine. Right off the bat, I began to notice some of the differences between running games using the built-in screen and via HDMI out. Atari games seem to be a bit softer when viewed using the system's built-in screen. HDTV output is a different story. Lacking any sort of blurring filter gives it a noticeably sharper image. But for me, the real issue for Atari games is in the button configuration. I have no idea what the thought process behind putting reset on a face button is, but that is exactly what's going on with Atari 7800 games. For Atari 2600 games, this functionality is put on the start button, which I'm hard pressed to decide whether it's better or worse. If you can overcome the muscle memory, then I guess there's a lot to like here. Alien Brigade is a cool Operation Wolf style gallery shooter. Food Fight is a lot more fun than it looks. And Ninja Golf is one of those games I've always heard about, but I've never played it until now. Atari Collection 2 has 20 more titles, although a handful are just the Atari 7800 version of games from the first collection. The button mapping issues persist, and I ran into a bizarre emulation glitch with the 7800 version of Desert Falcon that manifested some weird double image. Rebooting the game fixed it, but it was pretty trippy. Data East Collection 1 comprises 10 8 and 16-bit games, and is much more up my alley. The game selection is pretty unique, considering that most of Data East re-releases tend to focus on their arcade history. As with Atari games, both the NES and Super NES emulators remove any sort of filtering when using HDMI out. Some will likely find the shimmering to be a much larger issue though. Previously, the biggest complaint directed at the games for these two systems was the button mapping situation. This has been rectified with the recent firmware update, which addressed the issue with these two systems in particular. Now, SNES games are mapped as they should be, and NES uses the A and B buttons for standard inputs, and X and Y offer rapid fire variants of each. The Sega Genesis emulator, on the other hand, is something of an outlier, and that it's the only one that we can easily trace back to an existing source. Blastem is a cycle accurate emulator designed by Michael Pabone. The fact that Blaze Entertainment hired Pavone himself to port the emulator to the Evercade says a lot about their hopes and dreams for the system. And you know what? It runs extremely well. But it does have a weird deviation from the previously mentioned emulators. Genesis games are the only ones to have a forced bilinear filter on HDTV output. Another interesting footnote is the save states. Other emulators have slots for literally hundreds of save states, while Genesis games offer a more modest six per game. Not that it matters, I mean, who honestly needs 300 save slots? But I wonder if this was one of the sacrifices made to get the emulator to run well on the hardware. Finally, we have button mapping, which is again a problem. The A, B, and C buttons are mapped vertically on the Evercade's face buttons, A, B, and Y. This seriously made things so difficult for me to play, since I'm so used to button mappings being arranged horizontally. Or in the case of the Evercade, I wish that these buttons were mapped across X, A, and B. As I mentioned, the lineup of the Data East collection is pretty good, with my personal standout being Midnight Resistance. The controls are a bit wonky since the arcade game used a rotary joystick, but the soundtrack is one of my favorites on the system.
Joe and Mac 2 is another standout. This is a game that I had forgotten even existed until it was released on the Nintendo Switch Super NES app, and I was blown away by how good it is. This one probably has the most content of all the games on the cartridge. Then you have Bad Dudes, which most notably is one of two games on the cartridge to feature the worldwide fan favorite Data East original character, Karnov. I really hope that his self-titled NES exploits appear on the Data East Collection 2 if it's ever made. Outside of Karnov, the most notable aspect of Bad Dudes is the voice sample that accompanies the end of each level. I'm bad. The two Interplay collections include six games each, which compared to other cars doesn't seem like a whole lot. I feel as though these two cars could probably have been combined into one, but I guess they thought they could get away with it by putting Earthworm Jim and its sequel on separate carts. Earthworm Jim 1 is the Sega Genesis version, while Earthworm Jim 2 is the Super NES version. Which version is better? I'll leave that up to veterans of the series. You probably noticed that Clay Fighter is on here, which brings up an interesting aspect of all these collections. The two player modes in every game have been left intact although they can't currently be played that way. I'm guessing that a USB link cable of some sort will be released down the road, allowing for two-player gameplay where it's available. Mega Cat Studios Collection 1 has 10 games from the homebrew developer. I don't really follow the homebrew game development scene too closely, but Mega Cat Studios is one that I've heard of. Unfortunately, there's not a ton here that really gets me all that excited. Old Towers is a fun puzzle game that's more like a mobile game. Justice Duel is a take on Joust with a robot Abe Lincoln flying a bald eagle. Okay. Tanzer is probably the most interesting of the bunch, and it feels like it was inspired by Atomic Runner Chelnov, but with a robot who just wants to dance. Technos Collection 1 is all about Double Dragon and Kunio Kun games which means almost all the games are pretty good. Now, if you have a collection of older games, then you likely have at least one or two of these already. For my money, I think the NES version of Double Dragon 1 and 2 are much better than the arcade originals. Since the NES was not capable of RGB video, it's always interesting to see which color palettes are used whenever one of its games is emulated. Super Double Dragon, or rather, Return of Double Dragon, is a game I did a video on early on in the channel's lifetime. I'll admit that I've come to appreciate it more over the years since doing that video. It's amazing how much better it is than just about every game in the series that followed. That is, until Double Dragon Neon showed up. Pico Interactive Collection is made up of an assortment of 20 random games, many of which I'm admittedly not familiar with. Jim Powers' The Lost Dimension is worth checking out just for the Chris Hulsbeck soundtrack alone. The parallax scrolling gives me a headache, but more importantly, this game is insanely difficult. Most will have to abuse save states like crazy to see beyond the first stage. Which is too bad because it seems like there's some cool levels and uses of Mode 7 in future stages that people will only see in the rolling demo. Power Punch 2 was originally stated to be a Mike Tyson boxing game post Punch-Out, but he was removed during the home stretch of development. Top Racer is a rebranding of Top Gear for the SNES, which had to be renamed for obvious reasons. I had a fun time with Top Gear when a friend rented it when I was younger. The version in this collection seems to have a glitch where activating your Nitro will cause it to stay permanently active for the remainder of the race. You cannot turn it off. At first I thought this was some sort of cheat, but I couldn't find anything to suggest it. It's sort of hilarious that you're going over 200 miles per hour for an entire race, and you can even end up lapping your rival. This makes me suspicious just how much playtesting went into most of these games.
Namco is no stranger to re-releasing their classic games and compilations. They've been doing it for decades now. The two Namco collections have 11 games apiece. The first one is pretty standard fare with the NES versions of Pac-Man, Galaga, Dig Dug, and more. Like the Technos collection, it's likely that you already own at least one of these in some form or another. Collection 2, however, has some real interesting picks from their largely ignored Genesis library. Burning Force was a personal favorite of mine. And Philios is a pretty good vertically scrolling shooter for its time. If you're looking for a more detailed look at these games in particular, I did a video a few years back on Namco's games for the Sega Genesis. But the game most people will be after in this collection is Splatterhouse 3, since it's a pretty pricey game on original hardware. I'd never played it that much until now, and I think that I might like it more than the first two. The brawler-focused gameplay works well, although it seems like the move variety could be lacking in the long run. So, what do you think? The idea behind separate cartridges containing a curated selection of emulated classics will surely resonate with certain groups of people who play and collect games. If you think that sounds cool, and if the various quirks don't really bother you, then I'd say you're probably the exact audience for the Evercade. While it might not be exactly what I'm looking for, I absolutely have to applaud Blaze Entertainment's effort to make the Evercade something more than just another cheap emulation gadget and going through the proper channels to do it the best that they can. <laughs>